great day to be alive. What a great day to gather together with our church family and worship God for who he is and for what he has done. We're glad you are here. If you are new, do see some new faces. There is a um, little brochure in the pew back in front of you. Please grab that and take that home with you. Lots of information about uh, what we're about, uh, ways that, uh, we can serve you, ways you can get involved here, and a ton of contact numbers for our elders and deacons and ministers there. If you have any questions about uh, any ministry in particular. And also one thing we would ask of you, uh, the very last part of that is a perforated uh, visitor card you can fill out, and you can put that in the offering plates when those come around here in a moment, or you can put it in the offering boxes in the back on your way out, or just leave it in your pew and we'll grab it. We'd love to get to know you better if you would allow us to. Um, let's go through our bulletin for the week. Remember, we have a new verse of the month, 2 Corinthians 10, 17. We want to hide God's word in our heart, as the psalmist says, so that I may not sin against you, Psalm 119.11. So the verse of this month is 2 Corinthians 10.17 that says, Let the one who boasts, boasts in the Lord. What a great reminder for us to keep before us. Uh, guys, our men's ministry events, we have our second uh, Tuesday Men of Grace and Truth book study at 6 a.m., so it'll be this Tuesday. We are reading through John Owen's The Mortification of Sin. We're covering chapters 3 and 4. So come and join us for uh, free breakfast at 6 o'clock. 
have some discussion and prayer. We will be out by 7, so if you've got to get to class or to work there. And also our second Saturday men's breakfast is on the second Saturday of the month, which is this coming Saturday. And so we are actually going to change things up a little bit. We're going to be viewing uh, Matt Walsh's documentary, uh, What is a Woman? Uh, some of us have seen it. Uh, very eye-opening there. Uh, one kind of um, uh, heads up there that, that doesn't really cover the whole transgender thing from a theological worldview. This is a purely secular worldview, uh, but lots of stuff that we're going to look at, and then that's going to kind of lead the way for us to discuss, all right, here's sort of what's going on. Now, what does the Bible say about this, and how do we as Christ followers address this in a truthful, courageous, and loving way? In the past, we have opened that up for uh, you fathers of, of sons who want to bring your, your sons to Men of Grace, the breakfast, uh, have at it. Uh, this one, because the material is pretty sensitive, if you haven't seen this before, uh, it can get pretty explicit in terms of the way they describe things, and so uh, dads use caution. Uh, we'd probably suggest don't bring young uh, boys to this this time. Uh, our college and 20-somethings uh, group, we will be wrapping up our summer study. Our, our last study of the summer will be this Wednesday as we do our random popcorn theology topics at our house, uh, and then NSU classes will begin on August, 8, August 15th, that Monday there. And so I uh, just want to put before you, please look for new students as they're descending upon our town, uh, med students, uh, having a welcome back lunch for our college in 20-something. So college, grad students, med students, the last Sunday of August. So as you see, uh, people in town, uh, invite them to Grace and tell them we have a really good free home-cooked meal for them right after church that Sunday. Um, speaking of lunch... BCM, the Baptist Collegiate Ministry on campus, uh, we have a couple of dates that we'll be providing lunch for those students for what their weekly noonday meal. We provide a lunch and a, a devotional kind of topic there. And so that'll be on August 22nd and November 7th there. And so there's a sign-up sheet here in the North Foyer. So if you could help out by providing a, a, a main course or a side dish, please do that and let us know about that. Also, our family camp. So remember that family camp is for Anybody who is a part of the church family, come hang out. We'll be at Camp Egan just a few minutes down the road on Barron Fort Creek uh, for the whole weekend, uh, just talking about uh, the Word of God, getting to know one another, and having some great teaching there. And so there are uh, informational and sign-up packets for that. Please make sure that those are filled out and turned into the lockbox next to the office by September 25th. Also, for parents with kiddos, our Promotion Sunday for kids and youth will be August 28th, so uh, note the, the great distinctions there, the new ones we have. And there's also our college 20-somethings Sunday school class will resume back on the 21st of August, so I think that'll be next week. And then Grace Kids and Youth will resume on August 31st, that Wednesday night at 6.30 p.m. A couple things not in your, or one thing that is in your calendar, or your bulletin, but to point out there, are the kids' ministry needs there. So, uh, we still need three Sunday school nursery volunteers and two children's church volunteers uh, and then two Wednesday night volunteers to be added to the rotation. And so if you do have questions about that, uh, please contact Christy Young about that. Uh, and also one thing not in your bulletin is our communion, communion and deacons benevolence offering will be next Sunday. So we always want to make sure that we give you all a heads up on that because there is a proper way to take the Lord's Supper. And we want to make sure that you are one right with the Lord vertically, but also horizontally, uh, that if there's anything that is unresolved conflict between you and another family member at this church, make that right this week. Um, otherwise, you risk taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner there. And so, so please be aware of that. And also, when we do the, the Lord's Supper, we take up the Deacon's Benevolence Offering. That's a specific fund uh, that we have here just to help the members of our church when they fall in hard times. We want to be brothers and sisters and help each other out there. And so uh, please prayerfully consider giving to that uh, as well. If you give online, there is an option to, to designate that for the Deacon's Benevolence Fund as well. So that's all the housekeeping and announcements. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, God, we do thank you so much uh, for this glorious day. Uh, this is so uh, this is an amazing day because of who you are and because of what you've done uh, for us through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Thank you for this church body. Uh, we pray that uh, as we give of our tithes and our offerings here in a moment, as we sing these songs, as we receive the preaching of your word, Lord, that you would be high and lifted up, that you would be our honored guest, 
that all of this would be done uh, for your glory. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing a couple of hymns, starting with All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Let angels prostrate fall Bring forth the Lord your diadem And proudly Lord of all Bring forth the Lord your diadem And crown him Lord of all Verses 23 through 24. Then he said to them, to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. we 
This King of glory that pursues me with his love and haunts me with the cheering of his softly spoken words. My conscience, oh, my bill of forgiveness that I need. Who is this King of glory? Who offers it to me? Who is this king of angels? Who is the prince of peace? Revealing things of heaven and all its mysteries. My spirit ever longing for his grace in which to stand. Who is this King of glory, Son of God and Son of Man? His name is Jesus, precious Jesus, Lord Almighty, King of my heart, King of glory. Who is this King of glory?
is this King of glory? He's everything to me. His name is Jesus, precious Jesus, Lord Almighty, King of my heart, King of glory. His name is Jesus, precious Jesus, Lord Almighty. Good morning. All right, Ryan will be preaching today from Luke chapter 6, verses 12 through 19, which I will read for us. And in these days he went to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. And when the day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve, whom he named the apostles, Simon, whom he named, named Peter, and Andrew his brother, and James and John, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who is called the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. And he came down with them and stood on a level place, and with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured, and all the crowd sought to touch him, for power came out from him, and he healed them all. Um, God, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. Um, help Ryan, Lord, as he teaches your word. Help him to teach it faithfully. Help us, God, to have our hearts and minds ready to hear your word as we continue in our worship, Lord, through the preaching and teaching of your word. God, uh, just help us to, to be ready to hear your word, God, and then to be doers of your word. Just thank you, God, for our opportunity to be here to hear your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One of the things that I really enjoy is hearing various people's salvation stories in fact, plug for family camp, that's one of the beautiful things we get to share there is we get different folks that will come up and, and share their testimony of how they came to saving faith in Jesus Christ and just, just often I just, I just get chills. And, you know, some people are, have been raised in the faith and you, know, you really, maybe you're one of those and you don't even remember a time when you didn't know Jesus, when you, you know, weren't broken over your sin and trusting in him as your Lord and Savior, and, and yet there are others of us who came to faith in Christ later in life, and some stories that we hear really catch our interest, right? You know, we hear these miraculous accounts of transformation, someone rebelling hard against God, and, and then the Lord bringing them humbly to their knees and in faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and, you know, Paul was one of those stories, one of those people. He was someone who hated Jesus hated his followers. In fact, I want you to, I'll put it up here on the, on the screen or on the wall behind me. Listen to how the book of Acts describes Paul prior to his conversion. So this is Acts chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. It says, but Saul, who later became Paul, but Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. The way, that was the Christianity. If, I could, if he found any of those. But look, look at that first couple of words there. Breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. This, this is Paul. This is the one who would become an apostle, a sent one. One sent to the nations. One commissioned by Jesus to bring the message of Jesus to the world. I mean, it's, it's really an amazing story of God saving one like this. 
But I think one of the things that we shouldn't lose sight of is that it is equally miraculous that God would save any of us, whatever your salvation story is. That God would save you. Maybe he saved you from being that kind of a jerk or being this kind of a jerk. But he just saves you out of your sin, out of your deadness, out of your rebellion. That he would save us and use any of us for his glory and purposes. That should just amaze us, I think. Again, whether you were saved out of hate and drugs, immorality, or you were maybe just saved out of your pride and your self-righteousness and your laziness, all of us were dead in our trespasses and sins and needed the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I love the way Romans 5, 8 describes it. Many of you have it memorized, right? But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, that's when Christ died for us. Not when we kind of fixed ourselves and cleaned ourselves up, but while we were still sinners, that's when Christ died for us. So you see, if you have been saved, it's not because you earned it. It's because there's a God who loved you, even while you were in rebellion toward him. And while you were in that state of your sin, that's when he sent his son to die in your place to pay your fine. You see, salvation, what we have is 100% the grace, the kindness of God. Again, another couple of verses that many of us are familiar with, I will put these up here. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. That's an amazing word, grace. It's, it's God's favor, favor that he places upon you without your having earned it. In fact, in spite of the fact that you've done everything to not earn it and deserve it. He saves us in spite of what we deserve. But listen to me. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 doesn't end at verse 9. There's actually a 10. And many of us have memorized it, but not all. Look at Ephesians 10. See we, what he saved us for. Ephesians 2, 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So listen, if you're a child of God, if you've been saved by the grace of God, you've been saved for a task, for many tasks that he's already lined out that you would walk in. This is God's will for us. Here's the will of God, that we would trust in his son, being saved by his grace, and that we would now live lives of good works that God has prepared for us. Folks, that's what it means right there. That's, that's probably a good definition of just what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's discipleship. We spend our days trusting in and serving our Lord Jesus Christ, knowing Jesus and making him known. All right, we're moving into a section of Luke where Jesus selects his 12 inner circle, his 12 disciples, his 12 apostles, the ones that he chose and set apart to be the leaders of the early church, the men sent out with his authority, with his power, who would carry his message to the nations. And It's also interesting in these verses we're going to look at, there are really three groups of people. We've got this, this 12, the apostles, and then we have the disciples, a larger group, and then we have the multitude, a large number of people. And I think as we come to this text, that this section calls us as God's people, to faithfulness. Ask yourself this question. Are you willing to trust Jesus wherever he leads you? Are you willing to do whatever he has called you to do, no matter the cost? Or, listen to the option, or will you be like the multitude who want to see Jesus? They, many of them like Jesus. But ultimately, many of those will turn away when the going gets tough or when difficulties arise because we're following Jesus or, you know what, when Jesus offends you because he said something you're not comfortable with. Will you trust in and follow Jesus wherever he leads you? 
Let's dig into these verses and we'll see the men whom Jesus called to be his inner circle of 12. Starting in verses 12 and 13, we read this. And these days he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them 12 whom he named apostles. All right, so remember what's been going on in the book of Luke. We've seen Jesus, he's gathering a crowd, and of course this makes sense. He's I mean, casting out leprosy is gone. Demons are fleeing. There's this teaching that they've never really heard it like this before. And so people are coming from all over Israel to hear and to see what is going on, to be healed by this man. And earlier in chapter 5, we had seen that there were so many people gathered that he's being pressed almost into the lake. And so he gets into Peter's boat, backs out of the way, so he's got some distance between he and the multitudes. And, and this was just, again, commonplace for these crowds to gather and so you got to get that picture in your mind because how busy was Jesus while this is going on? He has people clamoring for his attention, more ministry than one man can do. And that's why I think verse 12 here is so important for us to see. Look at it again. In these days, he went out to the mountain to pray. Now, that the word there, actually two words in English, one word in Greek, where it says he went out, that's the Greek word ex erkamai, and it means to go out, to come out, to get away. So here's Jesus doing all of this amazing ministry, traveling, teaching, healing diseases, casting out demons, people clamoring for him. You've got some people that hate him, some people that love him, and yet this is the third time so far in the book of Luke, in these six chapters, that Luke records for us that Jesus sought out places and times to be alone, to be alone with God. In Luke 4, we saw this. He was, he, he'd healed Simon's mother-in-law. You remember the story? And then it says at the end of the day when the sun set, everybody just clamored at the door trying to be healed by him, and he was casting out de demons and healing everybody who came. And so that was late into the night, but the next verse says, and when it was day, he departed into a desolate place. Now, that text doesn't really tell us what he got away to do, but we see in the next chapter, in chapter 5, verses 15 and 16, in fact, I'll put it up here, we read this, Luke 5, 15 and 16, but now even more, the report about him went abroad, and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities, but he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. You know what we're seeing in the life of Jesus right here? It's a pattern. The pattern of Jesus was that he would work to get away to be alone with his heavenly Father, to seek him. This was a priority for Jesus during his ministry. And notice again, think about this, it didn't happen accidentally. It didn't just happen accidentally. He had to head off to the mountain to pray. In fact, we see here in our text that he spent at this time the whole night in prayer. So one of the things I think, we, again, we need to realize about Jesus or notice about the Lord is that he was devoted to prayer, to spending time in communion with God. In fact, he so exemplified prayer throughout his life that his disciples would ask him, Lord, teach us how to pray. So, question for you. If Jesus prioritized prayer that much, how much should you and I prioritize prayer? Getting alone to be in communion with God. And now let me make it a little more pointed. Does your life reflect the prayer priority that we see modeled in the life of Jesus? So think about your last week, your weekend. Does your life reflect that? I mean, all, all of us know we should pray, right? I mean, we know what Paul said to the Thessalonians. What did he say? Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. We know that. But th think about it with me. What does a lack of prayer indicate about us? I, I really want you to think about that. If you don't pray as much as you think you should, why don't you? In fact, if you have a community group this week, I think you'll be talking about some of these questions. Why don't we do this as much as we should? But what, what's at the root of prayerlessness? If we're not praying like we should or we think we should, 
What's at the root of that? You know what I don't think it is? I don't think it's your lack of discipline. Not necessarily. You know what I think ultimately it is? It's a lack of faith. John Calvin called prayer the chief exercise of faith. You see, the more we see God, his bigness, his purposes in this world, prayer is just natural. Prayer is an overflow of a life that is captivated by the majesty of this king. I don't think that the way we fix our, our shortcomings in prayer is to try, necessarily to try to be more disciplined. That You may need more discipline in your life. Many of us do. But I think where our focus needs to lie is that we need to see more of God. We need to see him. We need our minds and our hearts filled with him and his truth. When Jesus was, was teaching his disciples how to pray, he said this to them. It won't be up here. Just listen. This is Matthew 7. 9 through 11, he said, Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks him for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who asked him? So, think about this. I think one of the things we need to be reminded of is this, is that God is our Father. And that he is good. And that he is powerful. And you know what? He is calling on you to come to him in prayer. If you want to be more prayerful, I think the the first place to go is get in the word. Get in the word to see God. Ask him to open your eyes to see his glory. Ask him to open your eyes so that you see his purposes in the world. I'll tell you one other way to get prayerful is to, is to go share the gospel. You start realizing how quickly you need strength, you need boldness, you need clarity of words to say, you need help. But I am absolutely certain that when we have our eyes fixed on God, we, you, we won't be prayerless. We will not be prayerless. Jesus knew full and well who his father was. And so he lived in absolute beautiful communion with him. He sought out and made times to pray. Here in our text, we have him on the eve of one of the more important decisions of his life, the choosing of this inner circle of 12 apostles. And what's he do? He spends the whole night in prayer. Let's keep going. After this, he, he, he gathers his disciples. He prays. He gathers his disciples. And then he selects these 12. Now, another important thing to recognize here, too, is this. Notice that it says that there were many disciples in our text. So it's out of this group of, of his followers, he, he chooses these 12 men. And he calls them apostles. An apostle just simply means one who is sent. It's, it's an envoy. In the first century, an apostle was somebody who was sent by someone else who was in a position of high authority, and they would represent that person wherever they went, wherever they were sent. So these 12 men were to be Jesus' kind of main guys, his main disciples, who would be the closest to him, who would learn from him, who would be equipped by him, and then he would be sent, they would be sent out with his authority and message. In fact, these apostles, according to Scripture, are the foundation for us, the church, Put up here Ephesians 2, 19 and 20. It says this, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. So the foundation, folks, of the church is the apostles, the prophets. They're teaching. The teaching of what they proclaimed after the, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ Jesus, he's the, he's the cornerstone. He's the chief angle. But the foundation is, is the teaching of the apostles. Now, one thing to note here on this is there are no apostles today in this sense. Okay, you, you can be, you're, you're to be sent by the Lord. In that sense, you would be a small A apostle. But this is a big A apostle. There, there are some churches that think that the pastor of their church, in fact, I've heard pastors here in town say he is the apostle for this church, and what he says is the word of God for the people. 
yeah, no. Um, there was only one other apostle that would be added to this number. Who was that? That would be Paul, right? Each of these men who were designated as the 12 had seen the resurrected Lord. They were specifically chosen by him for this purpose. They saw the resurrected Christ. That is, everyone saw the resurrected Christ except for one. And you know who probably that one is. You'll figure it out as we go along. If not, but let's take a look at these 12 men whom Jesus chose to be his closest companions and followers. So look at verses 14 through 16 with me. So here's the 12. Simon, whom he named Peter and Andrew his brother and James and John and Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew and Thomas and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Now, we're going to get to know these guys, many of them, as, as we continue through the book of Luke. But I want to mention a few things on each of these right now. And so the first one on the list is Simon, again, who is also named Peter by the Lord Jesus. And, and Simon, Peter, may be one of the most well-known of the apostles, What's interesting is in every list of the 12 apostles, he's always the first. It seems that he was the spokesperson, maybe the leader of the apostles. You know, remember, you can probably think of all kinds of stories for Simon. You know, remember, he was the one that when in the middle of the night as their boat is being tossed in the storm, he sees Jesus walking across the sea, and he goes out to him until he begins to look at the wind and the waves and begins to sink, and Jesus rescues him. So he's that one. He's also the one who, when Jesus asks, all right, folks, who do our, my inner circle here, who do people say that I am? And you remember, you know, some said this, some said this. Well, who do you say that I am? And Peter's answer was, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then not only that, but he's the one right after he makes that amazing confession that tries to stop Jesus from going to be crucified. You know, Lord, you're not going to go be crucified. And you remember what Jesus said to him? Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. Peter's just amazing because he got these amazing highs, these amazing lows. Another one was when Peter, Lord, I will go with you even to death. And what did Jesus say to him? No, in fact, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And he did that very thing. But what's also amazing is after the Lord Jesus was resurrected, he came to Simon and he said, Peter, do you love me? And you know, Peter's response, Lord, you know, of course I love you. Well, then feed my sheep. So Peter is just famous for having denied the Lord, having stood for the Lord. One thing um, to note as we're looking at this list of 12, though, is this, is we have 10 men in this list who were killed for the Lord Jesus Christ, for their faith in Christ, their testimony of Jesus. We have 10 who were killed, one who was exiled, and one who committed suicide. Sounds like a good job description there, right? Want to join this crowd? But Peter, Peter served as a missionary. We read about this throughout the book of Acts. According to church history, he was martyred under Nero, where he was tortured and then crucified upside down. And that was at his request because he did not feel worthy to be crucified in the same way as his Lord. Well, that's Peter. Andrew, don't have quite as much on Andrew, but Andrew is Peter's brother. He had been a disciple of John the Baptist, and he was the one who actually brought Peter to Jesus. And in fact, one of the things that's interesting about Andrew is often in the Gospels, we'll find him bringing people to Jesus. Well, Andrew became a missionary to what is now modern-day Turkey as well as Greece, and he was martyred there. Now, history tells us that he was crucified on an X-shaped cross in Greece, and the account records that seven soldiers whipped him severely and then they tied his body to the cross with cords because they wanted to prolong his agony. His followers reported that as he was led to the cross, he saluted it with these words. He said this, I have long desired and expected this happy hour. The cross has been consecrated by the body of Christ hanging on it. And it was told that as he was hanging there dying, he continued to preach Jesus Christ to even his tormentors who were putting him to death. And it was two to three days before he died. Well, that's Andrew. The next one, the third one on the list is, is James. This is the brother to John. Now, Peter, James, and John seem to be kind of the, the inner circle of the inner circle, the closest to, to Jesus. 
Now, it's interesting of James and John, Jesus gave these two brothers. You remember the nickname he gave them? The sons of thunder. You know, they were the ones who wanted to call down fire from heaven to consume the adversaries. And so these guys were just the sons of thunder. Well, one of the things that they're also famous for is that their mommy asked Jesus if these two could sit at their, his right hand when he came into his kingdom. Man, I would hate to have that recorded in history for everybody. <laughs> but James, um, James is the first to be martyred among the 12. In fact, he's the only apostle's death who is recorded in the Bible. In Acts chapter 12, it says this, at that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. So James as well was a, a testifier, a witness for Christ, and he was put to death. The next one lists is John, the brother to James. They were all, these brothers were also business partners with Peter in the fishing business. But uh, the Gospel of John, in the, in the Gospel of John, he refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. John got it. He knew Jesus loved him. He never once referred to himself by name in that Gospel. He called himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. And in fact, he is um, often called the disciple of love or the apostle of love because he wrote so much about calling us to love God and to love one another. He is the only one of the 12 that wasn't martyred. Isn't that amazing? Or, well, yeah, of the 12, because Paul was as well. Other than Judas, who, who uh, took his own life. But he died and was buried in Ephesus. He's also the one who wrote five of the New Testament books. He wrote the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, as well as the book of the Revelation. Now, what you may or may not know is even though he died of natural causes, he did face martyrdom. At one point, he was boiled in a huge basin of boiling oil during a wave of persecution in Rome. Um, miraculously, though, he was delivered from death. John was then sentenced to the mines in the prison island, on the prison island of Patmos. It was there that he received his visions for the book of the Revelation. He was later freed, and he returned to what is now modern-day Turkey, and he died as an old man, the only apostle to die peacefully. All right, number five, Philip. Philip was called by Jesus to follow him, and, and he is the one who brought, and you might remember him as the one who brought Nathanael to Jesus. In fact, in John 1, it says that um, Jesus, as he was heading to Galilee, he found Philip, and he said, follow me. And then Philip went, and he found, his, he found Nathanael, and he said, listen, we found him, the one of whom Moses wrote, and the law and the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Well, Philip was interesting. He seems to be one who quickly realized that this was the Messiah. Um, now, one thing to note with Philip is that he is not the same as Philip the evangelist and the deacon in the book of Acts. Some of it gets kind of confusing because you get, all right, which James are we talking about? Which Philip are we talking about? Which Simon are we talking about? Uh, Philip, according to what we understand, spent his life as a missionary in North Africa as well as Asia Minor and as well as martyred. We don't have much information on that. Another name that you may or may not be as familiar with is Bartholomew, the next name on our list. Now, some of you might remember Bartholomew by another name. Anybody know his other name? Nathaniel, also known as Nathaniel. Remember Nathaniel when Philip came to him and was told that we found this one that Moses talked about, Jesus of Nazareth. What was his response? Wait, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And then, of course, he meets Jesus, and Jesus says, you know, behold, an Israelite in whom there is no guile or no deceit, and he's like, you know, how do you know me? He said, well, before Philip called you, I saw you under the tree. And then we get this beautiful response by Bartholomew or Nathaniel, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Well, the Gospels don't give us a whole lot about Bartholomew or Nathaniel. History tells us that he became a missionary, went to Asia. He preached Jesus in what is present-day Turkey. He was martyred for preaching in Armenia. In fact, I'm not going to tell you a whole lot more about him because I'm going to end this sermon by just a short uh, synopsis of what happened at the end of his life. So we'll come back to Bartholomew. Number seven on the list is Matthew. And of course, we looked at Matthew just a couple of weeks ago. He is also known as who? Levi, the tax collector. He is the one who wrote the gospel of Matthew. Matthew became a missionary to Ethiopia. Around 60 AD, he was either beheaded or stabbed to death. Next one on the list is Thomas. Now, Thomas is 
kind of infamous why. What do we often call Thomas? Doubting Thomas. That's right, because he is the one who's like, I'm not going to believe he's risen unless I get to see him and put my hand in his side and all that. Um, I, I, really, that's an unfair, I think, characterization of Thomas, because prior to that maybe lack of faith, um, when Jesus was planning to go to Jerusalem, Thomas was the one that rallied the disciples and said, let us all go with him, that way we can die with him. He was ready to die for Christ. Thomas ended up becoming a missionary to Syria as well as India, and he was martyred around 70 AD. It says that he was killed with a spear while he was in India. Number nine on the list is James. This is somebody called James the Less. How would you like that nickname? James the Less. Now, I, we don't know which, if, if this means, was he the younger, was he younger than the other James? Because there are two James on this list. Or maybe it was that he was shorter than the other James. You know, really, we don't know. There's not a whole lot written about him. We do know from history that he became a missionary to Syria. It's believed that he was the James that was put on trial in Jerusalem and was thrown from the top of the temple when he refused to denounce Jesus Christ. The fall didn't kill him, it just broke his legs, and he continued to proclaim Christ until they clubbed him and crushed in his skull. And that is how James died. Number 10 on the list is Simon, also called Simon the Zealot. Now, this isn't because he was passionate. The zealots in the first century were a political group, a political radicals who, whose whole goal in life was to overthrow the Roman occupation, Roman rule. Now, now stop and think about this for a minute. We're talking about the inner 12 here. One of them is a zealot, this religious zealot who's anti-Rome. Who else is one of the inner 12? We just talked about him. Levi, Matthew. Matthew was a Roman collaborator who was a tax collector. I mean, here we've got this radical zealot and a collaborator, two opposite ends of the spectrum, and yet they are the inner circle of 12 disciples, 12 apostles for Jesus Christ. One of the things I was thinking on this is that Jesus is the cure for the animosity that separates us when we're centered on him. When we are centered on him, that, that puts away the other agendas. There's so many differences that we've got in this room, but you know the main thing we've got in common is we have one Father, we have one Savior, we have one hope and calling. Jesus and his gospel should be what unites us in our life and our priority. Well, Simon the Zealot became a missionary to North Africa, Spain, even Great Britain. He was martyred, and according to history, it said that he was sawn in half. All right, number 11 is Judas. Now, this is Judas, the son of James, also called Thaddeus. Don't know a whole lot about him other than that he was martyred around 70 A.D., as, as well it was a missionary as he was, um, he was martyred by being shot with arrows, it was said. All right, the last one on the list is the infamous apostle Judas, or Judas Iscariot, as it says in our text, who became a traitor. Now, stop and think about that. The, Judas Iscariot is also one that Jesus chose for his inner circle. He, he chose one who would betray him. Well, remember, why did Jesus come? Jesus came to lay down his life, to save us. He came to die in our place. And so here he is, even in the selection of these 12, he's choosing the one who's going to help to fulfill the whole role that Jesus came to do. Judas would betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Betray him with a kiss. Maybe you've heard of the kiss of betrayal. This is where that comes from. Well, one thing to note as we consider these, the lives and the deaths of these apostles is that these are really accounts that are recorded in church tradition, church history, and there's actually a lot of discrepancies. We're not sure who was killed in what way, um, and so we, we need to be cautious about putting too much weight on all of these stories other than the, the one that was recorded in Scripture but what's not so important is how the apostles die, but what's important is the fact that they were willing to die for their faith in Jesus Christ. Think about what that means. If Jesus hadn't really been resurrected, would they have died for the gospel? The gospel is that Jesus Christ lived a perfect life. He died on the cross to pay for our sins, and he rose from the dead so that we can have eternal life with God 
would you really get these men giving their lives for something they knew was not true? Really, the, the horrible deaths of these apostles is, is incredible testimony to the validity, the truthfulness of the life, death, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. One thing I, I was thinking of just kind of last moment, too, on this. These men were willing to go to horrible deaths for the Lord Jesus Christ, live in, in very much difficult circumstances. What stops us, church? I mean, are we afraid someone's going to think bad about us or make fun of us or not like us? I mean, I guarantee you, you could go downtown now and you, you'll find some people that will, will reject you. I almost got punched a few weeks back. I thought I was going to anyway. I was trying to share the gospel with somebody. But listen, that's the worst I've ever had it. I mean, most of the time when I share the gospel with somebody, I get thanked. Occasionally I have people ignore me. I had one guy, you know, just slide a, the, the track and throw it back at me and all in a huff. When I, when I think of what these guys went through, their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, what in the world's holding us back? from sharing the gospel. All right. All right, so there we have the 12. Let's look at the next three verses as we wrap this up. Verses 17 to 19 says this, And he came down with them and stood in a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases and those who were troubled with uh, with unclean spirits were cured. And the crowd, and all the crowd, sought to touch him, for power came out from him and healed them all. Okay, what we're seeing here, we're seeing these massive crowds. I, mean, I would love to see what this looked like. These huge crowds coming to see Jesus, to hear Jesus, to be healed by Jesus. And again, I want to point out that we've got in this group three different sections or gatherings of people. We've got this great multitude, it says. Then we have this great crowd of disciples, so there's a lot of them. And then we have these 12 apostles. But I think the really big distinction for us is between the crowd who wanted to see Jesus for all these different reasons and those who were the disciples, the followers of Jesus. And so my question, I guess I want to pose to you is, is who are you? Who are you? Are you... A Jesus fan, or are you a Jesus follower? What's your life show? There are going to be a lot of fans of Jesus who will be thrown into hell one day. They, they like Jesus. They've heard of him. They, they agree with him. They, they, they believe in certain things about him, but they've never repented of their sins and put their faith in him as their Savior. Remember at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talked about how a lot of people were going to come to him at the end times on the last day, and they say to him, Lord, Lord. He said, listen, not everyone who says that is going to enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Let me go on. It says, on that day, many will say to me, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. That's a scary thought. Many are going to say to Jesus on the day, Lord, we knew you. He's like, well, I didn't know you. So what's, because he says there, um, not these ones are the ones that enter the kingdom, but the one who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. So what's the will of God for us? Well, Jesus said it in John 6, 40. He said, this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So again, let me ask you the question, as you're sitting in here, are you a fan of Jesus, or are you his follower? Are you his disciple? Followers of Jesus, disciples are those who go after him who learn from him, who trust in him, who obey him. 
Followers seek to love and obey Jesus. Why? Because he's our king. He's our savior. The 12 apostles are a testimony to us of the reality and the power of Jesus Christ. The son of God. The only hope for humanity. <clears throat> They're a testimony that Jesus is worth following even unto death. In fact, I would say sometimes it's easier to say I'd, I'd die for Jesus than it is to actually live for him. I'm glad I don't struggle with that. Just you heathens out there. No, we all do, don't we? Armenia in 70 AD. You are unsettling the worship of our gods. And not only that, you have perverted my own brother the king of Armenia, shouted at Bartholomew. But Bartholomew did not back down. One of the original 12 apostles, he had boldly preached Jesus Christ through many years, starting with the lost in the cities throughout what is now known as Turkey. He then traveled to India. In India, he learned the language, and he translated the gospel of Matthew into the Indian language so that he could proclaim the gospel in their native tongue. Later, he preached in 12 different cities in the country of Armenia. And Armenia is located between present-day Turkey and Iran. Many people turned from idolatry to worship Jesus, including the king of Armenia's brother and his family. Bartholomew boldly answered the king, saying, I have preached the true worship of God throughout your country. I have not perverted your brother and his family, but rather have converted them to the truth. King Astagius threatened Bartholomew, unless you stop preaching Christ and make sacrifices to the god Ashtaroth, you will be put to death. <clears throat> you can be sure of this, King Astagius. I will never sacrifice to your idol. I would rather seal my testimony with my blood than do the smallest act against my faith or conscience. Upon hearing this, the king ordered, I want this man to suffer torture. First, beat him with rods. After that, suspend him upside down on a cross and skin him alive. Following the king's command, <clears throat> Bartholomew was beaten, crucified, and flayed with whips. Despite all this, he was still conscious and continued to exhort the people to believe in Jesus and worship the true God. Finally, to prevent him from saying anything else, the king's men took an axe and cut off his head. Bartholomew was united with Jesus, his Lord. Let's pray. Ah, Father, I... I need to repent. Repent of my apathy and repent of my fear of man. Help us, Lord, to see you. Grant us, grant us eyes to see the glory of our King. Grant us eyes to, to see that you are the reality be, behind all reality. That Jesus Christ is the only hope for ourselves in Tahlequah and Oklahoma and, and the ends of the earth. Father, I, I, ask, I ask now that you would raise up laborers for your harvest field. That you would raise up men and women from this place who will love you with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength and who will proclaim your gospel to the ends of the earth. Father, forgive us for the excuses that we make, for the distractions that we allow to pull us away. Cleanse us, Lord, of those things that we can glorify you in everything that we do. May our passion be your glory, for your glory. Thank you for, for loving us. We don't deserve it, Lord. We don't deserve your love, and yet you lavish it on us. Thank you for your love. Thank you for Christ, our Savior and our King. Now in his name, Lord, we, uh, we go out and we pray in his powerful 
mighty and hopefully soon coming name. Amen. Let's stand. This blood is went to me. Mine was the sin that drove a bitter guilt and hung him on that judgment tree. I will glory in my Redeemer who crushed the power of sin and death. My only Savior. Me too. 
This Saturday, we will have um, a gathering to, to consider that topic, what is a woman, the, the video has put in point out, been put out, but following that, uh, a few of us are going to go down to the skate park, and um, there is a mental health fair being put on this year for the youth. Unfortunately, it, it's peddling a wrong agenda in many ways, but we are going to go with a message of love and truth. And so if you would like to join us, you contact myself or Joe, and uh, you're welcome to come. We want to share the gospel. There's one hope. There's one fix. 
and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me read a few verses here out of the book of Revelation as we come to a close. Now there, are, now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before God. I love this next verse. And they have conquered him... Who, the devil, have we conquered? By the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they loved not their lives even unto death. Therefore, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. Church, I want to encourage you. Make his time miserable because you're going to proclaim this message, and this king, because you love not your lives even unto death, you are sent.